And uh, so would everyone please rise and pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank all right, so we have our minutes to adopt today. Um, I'd like to move the adoption of the minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jerry. Are there any questions, comments about the minutes? Okay, good meeting. So, all in favor of adopting the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Thank you. All right, do we have anything to talk about before our first presentation? Uh, Executive Director uh, Lindbergh? No, no, we're good. We're good? Okay. Are you going to save it for later? <laughs> no, she's for a record. Does that mean a rush? Okay. Uh, so our first, um, our first uh, is our executive director's report in Folsom Borough. Um, they had a uh, 2018 master plan re-examination report, a number of ordinances that need to be reviewed by the executive director, and that's what I guess um, the chief planner is here today to talk about. Uh, it's, 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 actually, yes, but I'm not going to describe this to you. Um, we're actually very happy to have this on the agenda for you this morning. We've been working with Paul for a while, right? Do we have any representatives in the audience today for Paul if there are, there are. Oh, there are. They are okay. they they're to work here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody live in Baltimore? <laughs> so I'll let Brad explain to you the process we've gone through. So I'm just going to ask Paul if you could maybe some of those slides. I have exhibit one. Which one would you like? Exhibit one. And you can just leave it. Um, so yes, uh, this has been uh, an interesting process that started um, back in 2017. Uh, Borough contracted with the Department of Community Affairs to. Uh, to facilitate the re-examination process. Um, uh, they met with us on multiple occasions, uh, I think dating back to like the summer of 2018, uh, to discuss various rec you know, various recommendations and ways we could implement them through ordinances. Um, and so yeah, the, the culmination was a re-examination report adopted in November of 2018, and an ordinance uh, 07-2019, which was adopted um, back in December of 2019. Um, so, uh, so I'll briefly go over the contents of the examination report and then get a little more detail about uh, the implementing ordinance. So the, the re-examination report um, adopts into their existing master plan a set of new objectives and goals that are simply taking into consideration the, the changing conditions and planning approaches within the borough. Um, it also uh, adopted a new housing element and recreational element. Um, prior to this, the borough did not have those elements in the master plan. Um, so uh, the re-examination report also contained recommendations uh, involving amendments to their land development ordinances. Um, the major recommendation that I'll be detailing has to do with a uh, a new uh, zoning district on the Black Horse Pike um, that's called the Rural Development Commercial District, um, and it entails a uh, management area change. Uh, so, for context, during the re-examination process, uh, a major goal for the borough was to expand opportunities for non-residential development along the Black Horse Pike. Uh, the Black Horse Pike is one of three arterial roads. Uh, within the borough, um, and you can sort of see it. It's yes. Better you than me. So yeah, apologies. You should have these exhibits uh, in your report. Um, yeah. So uh, this is the Black Horse Pike along here. Um, route State Route 54 is here, and State Route 73 cuts across sort of diagonally. Those are the three main arterial roads. 
And the Black Horse Pike is uh, sort of the main traditional commercial corridor, primarily in this area yeah. along, along this area. Um, so, however, development is, is constrained in those areas due to expansive wetland systems. So over the years, commission staff has worked with the borough to come up with various uh, zoning uh, approaches that sort of balance the protections of these wetland systems, but while providing limited opportunities for development in appropriate areas, given that you know, borough is a constrained um, municipality in terms of its size and areas where non-commercial non development can occur. Um, so, DCA, Commission staff, Borough first evaluated the concept of expanding this forest commercial district, um, which is in the forest area and therefore has um, some strict limitations on uh, what types of commercial development can be developed there. Um, and it was found that, it, it, that given CMP provisions, it would not be possible to extend the Forest Commercial District any further to the east along Black Horse Pike. Um, as an alternative, um, staff and DCA and the borough looked at recommending uh, expanding the rural development area, um, which is in this area uh, of the borough, sort of further uh, west down Black Horse Pike. Um, so, uh, the ordinance uh, 072019 implements uh, those recommendations and they include uh, you know, adopting a revised zoning map that establishes the service <laughs> zone uh, and as well as offsetting changes uh, that sort of uh, that involve uh, changing management area from rural development area to forest area. So uh, Paul, if you could maybe pull up slide two. Thank you. So, unfortunately, the blue is not showing up quite so well on here. So, the, the blue outline sort of includes a few lots with frontage in the existing rural development area that. Um, that has existing commercial development on it. So those were sort of, it, if you're creating a rural development commercial area, it makes sense to include those within them. Um, the lots that are undeveloped and would constitute a Highlands management area change are these three lots right here. Um, they have frontage along, uh, along Black Horse Pike. Uh, they are undeveloped. They have some uplands that provide a potential for development. Um, Paul, if you could bring up slide you know, exhibit number three. Get my steps in. So as I mentioned previously, wetlands are you know extensive in these areas. So again, I'm just gonna highlight these are the three lots here. They are approximately 62 acres. So I mean there's no doubt that there is the presence of wetlands buffers, you know, according to our data. Um, and that any sort of development would still need to meet all of the CMP's requirements related to uh, 300 foot buffers. But you know, this still this would provide the opportunity for some uh, utilization of the upland areas along uh, along those lots along the Black Horse Pike. Um, so this uh, RDC district permits a variety of non-residential uses, including community commercial agricultural product sales and establishments, um, recreational facilities, as well as conditional, conditionally permits uh, nursery schools, daycare centers, um, and institutional uses. Um, as an offset, um, Paul, if you could pull up uh, exhibit number four. Uh, as an offset, we looked at various um, lots throughout the whole borough that could potentially um, make sense to change from uh, rural development area to forest area. What we found and recommended to the borough was uh, 69 lots uh, totaling 76 acres. And again, they're highlighted in blue. So here's a large portion, a large few lots here, a lot here, and then some very undersized lots uh, in this area. And um, again, these were selected because they had extensive wetlands and wetlands buffer uh, wetlands buffers, um, and uh, they're 
undeveloped with uh, and are generally owned by either the state or the borough. Um, so given the development constraints, it seems that redesignations of forest area would be uh, an appropriate reflection of their limited development potential. So yes, and Paul, if you could bring up the uh, final exhibit. So here you can sort of see, um, you know, all of the lots are you know, heavily constrained by the presence of weapons. Wetland, wetlands are were a real challenge, as you can see. A very, it's a very small municipality, but it has these major highways that go right through it. Um, and then the wetlands are just, they're just everywhere. They really parallel the road in many cases, and so we really struggle to um, in recognizing the borough. You know, they, they didn't want a lot, they just wanted some additional potential on a highway for a couple more, perhaps, commercial uses. And so, um, it was, it was a challenge to identify lands. We, did, we, we are comfortable, though, with the, the three lots that would be rezoned to the rural development area, but um, they do have some development potential and should provide some additional opportunity for commercial uses. And here, when you look here, this is an area in the borough that probably hadn't been looked at since the borough's original certification in whenever that was, maybe it may have been a little bit later. And when you look at it now, you wonder you know, why were some of these areas included in the rural development area when they're clearly not developed. So it made sense to sort of make some corrections and adjustments. Maybe they didn't know. Too. They didn't have the information. I don't. I don't think that's the case. Maybe okay. We would have had weapons information, and we were, you know, not. We would have had fancy maps and GIS capabilities, but we, we certainly knew about weapons constraints when we were doing the original certification. So I think it's just one of those. Um, it, it, this happens a lot with you just now you've already have it worked with them for 20 or 30 years when you go back and look, it's clear that some adjustments would make sense. And so um, yeah, uh, so the the ordinance uh, had a few other amendments. This was clearly the, the major thrust of, of the recommendations in the re-examination report and an ordinance. I'll just note a couple of other minor things that were included in the ordinance and more thoroughly detailed in the ED report. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was an existing forest commercial district. Um, they have eliminated uh, residential uses as a permitted use in that district. Um, this goes towards the efforts of the borough to target and promote non-residential uses along the Black Bush Pike. Um, but they do grandfather in existing single family dwellings uh, along, along the Black Horse Pike or in the, within the Forest Commercial District. Um, the borough also repealed their conservation subdivision uh, uh, provisions and replaced them with CMP's mandatory clustering provisions. So this was an interesting case where the borough had adopted mandatory, mandatory clustering requirements prior to the CMP requiring those, those mandatory requirements. Uh, and they were substantially consistent with the CMP, so there wasn't a need for them to adopt our language verbatim. But through this process, they decided they wanted to avoid any potential confusion and just adopt our, our clustering regulations uh, verbatim. Uh, the ordinance also contained some related, uh, some amendments related to the development transfer program. These, again, are sort of incorporating existing CMP language related to deed restrictions for non-contiguous lands that are used to meet density requirements. Um, and lastly, I'll just note that there were no public comments received during the public hearing or comment period. Um, so in conclusion, we are uh, we find that the, the borough's 2018 master plan or examination report and ordinance 7 2019 are consistent with CMP. Um, and we are requesting uh, the committee to recommend to the full commission the certification of these documents. Brad, for the um, the lots that are along Blackwood's Pike, which is not the first commercial, is the firm a technical closer to the construction on the type of commercial you can go there? And then the proximity of wetlands that are going to allow things like gas stations or oil change places. Um, so, uh, 
It includes community commercial, agricultural products, sales establishments, agricultural processing facilities, and other light industrial uses, um, daycare centers, institutional uses, and it also includes uh, various like bulk standard setback requirements um, and would have to meet our existing rules for you know not approaching within 300 feet of, of, of delineated wetlands. Um, I think they basically took the the list of uses in the CMP for the rural development area and um, plotted it to the ordinance. So when it says community commercial, I don't know that they define that. It's mm -hmm. probably not. We don't either. CMP doesn't define that either, by the way. So it could be a variety of things. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if it poses a concern for us within the proximity of this you know, borders on wetlands. Well, I'll say no just because um, the, you know, the same wetlands protection standards, buffer standards would apply whether. No matter what they use, even if it was still in a forest area, if somebody wanted to build something there, you know, the same protections and buffers would apply um, for any commercial use. We'll have to approve anything that um, does seem to be developed there, I guess, if there's new development in those lots. How does it meet, you know, seasonal high water table requirement to a septic system and buckets? All the normal standards will oh. still apply. Really, the only, the only thing that's really changing is before. Um, the new zoning, um, new commercial non-residential uses have not been permitted in a forest area designation. Right. Now these three lots will, will have the opportunity for some, but we'll probably end up being very limited yeah. commercial development. Okay. Thank you. Uh, General, question. The, uh, the area will not be sewered. Correct. And so uh, daycare would be quite intense. The lots are each about 20 acres in size, I think, that are being added. So um, that really will end up, it's the lot size and the septic pollution standards that will end up controlling how intensive and how large any kind of non-residential use can be. So for a daycare facility, they, they're going to have to meet the water quality standards and maybe they're only a very small. They also probably won't be the permanent treatment for it. Could be. The, the, uh, other thing I noticed is that the area that is being presented for commercial development is all forested. There's three lots, yes. So we're losing uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, and I noticed that the lands that we're getting are not forested. Uh, I would say actually they, yeah, they, they are. are. It, they it, might, yeah, it might be obscured given the, the resolution of the maps, um, but all of those small lots uh, in this top corner here are all undeveloped. Um, this area here also undeveloped. Now, they, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly sort of the land cover type, but it's definitely undeveloped. Um, I'm just looking at the Slide three. And it shows not heavily forested in those two areas. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's, no, there's, there's, no, there's no development on them, there's no housing, you know, structures. So we're giving up forest and we're gaining weapons that we already have. Correct. So that is one way to look at it. You're, you're adding, um, you know, small amounts of developable land to the rural development area and the land here that are being redone back to the forest area is largely undeveloped land. That is correct. Um, that's the, the offsetting management area change that Brad was talking about. I think on balance, though, what we're trying to do for the borough is, um, you know, identify perhaps these, these may be the last three lots left in the borough that could be added to a development category and have any possibility of development on the highway at an intersection, which seems to make sense from a planning perspective. Yes, they're forested, absolutely. Um, but even in the forest area designation, someone can propose to build houses there and clearing would be allowed. Clearing will be limited to what they need for the permitted use, and the same thing will happen if someone proposes, um, I don't know what is the examples of something that might be, you know, likely to be built here, but you know, a store of some sort on this 20 acre piece. They're not going to be permitted to clear the 20 acres, they're going to be allowed to clear what they need for their use, you know, the driveway, the parking, and the building. 
It's not like we're stuck. So whatever does end up there because it can't be stored, will be fairly limited in terms of size and disturbance. I, I took a look at um, these pieces that um, were being converted uh, into um, forests. And um, from what I can tell, they were all wooded. Um, the piece that was close to Monroe Township seemed to be blighted with the, um, the beetle, south, uh, south um, um, pine beetle. Um, so the tree there was sparse. Uh, but, uh, so I, I think the quality of bars, yes, I think that being um, the, uh, zoned into um, uh, commercial um, rural development, Maybe a little denser, uh, but if you consider that um, the zoning in a lot of these areas is being changed from uh, F20 to F30, or is it F30, which decreases the housing potential of the land, does that as well. Um, you have to look at the balance, as, as you mentioned, and uh, perhaps uh, in the end, it's kind of like in balance. Yes, yes. Do, do we know um, how much commercial square footage will be able to be built in this place? I think typically using a standard septic system would be required here. We usually estimate what, 800 to 1,000 square feet per acre is possible. Depends on the use that's proposed. So, um, um, I mean, I support this, but, but I think Jerry's point is well taken. I mean, we're, we're, we're preserving things that are already preserved, and we're, we're trading off parts. And one of the things we might want to think about in the future is a way to consider carbon sequestrations. I'm not sure how that would play here in the last few Right, right. At least consider it. But, um, you know, but, but it, it appears this is probably the way it should have been that 30 years ago, but we didn't. We didn't go right. for whatever. As Ken right. says, we had it right on the media. Right. I mean, it is, I mean, I, I always look at these things, it's, it's largely what you're doing. You're trying to recognize existing conditions. Um, you're trying to make some change that makes sense from a planning perspective and also recognize not mistakes that were made, but better technology, better data. When you look at the maps, it seems to make some sense. Adjust the boundaries. Why have land to the rural development area that can't be developed? That just sends the wrong message. We try not to do that now. When the townships come in and ask for changes, we try to make sure we're not putting undevelopable lands into cash management categories where people are going to have unrealistic expectations. So it's sort of a combination of all those things at play here. How, how, I was a little, um, how often is DCA involved in these things? I don't recall their involvement. Right, so it's sort of a new, it's sort of a new effort. Um, if you recall, not too long ago, Pemberton Township um, adopted a new redevelopment plan for the Grand Hills area, and that's something that DCA they contracted with DCA um, to work with them. So um, I don't know how many years ago now it was when council and affordable housing sort of ceased to operate. So the staff is part of DCA. And they were assigned to this local planning services office. And this is one of the things that they do, is they work with numerous municipalities all over the state on various things like master plans, redevelopment plans. Um, they provide their services for free to the municipality. And there are contracts involved and agreements and um, work products that are produced. Um, and municipalities have to apply for the services and Really, only the, the needier, more uh, the poor municipalities are the ones who qualify. There's a series of criteria. So, Pemberton, for example, qualified, um, and DCA prepared a very beautiful new redevelopment plan for Pemberton. It's quite nice. Um, same thing here. They produced the new city master plan document for Folsom. Um, they worked with Woodbine Borough to do a new master plan that was recently adopted, so you'll be seeing that um, sometime at some point this year. Um, and I believe they are going to be working with, I think it's Egg Harbor Township on a redevelopment plan. They have a couple other finance municipalities that I think they're working with. But, but it's going fairly well, I think, after the first few few um, meetings and things where we're sort of 
feeling our way along and how we could work together and um, make sure that we weren't making more things more complicated for some of our municipalities. That kind of happened a little bit with Colson when PCA was trying to help them and write ordinances and we were trying to review them and explain it. No, you know, language had to be a certain way and and felt a little bit bad and sort of caught in the middle there during the process. Um, but but um, you know the end result I think was really good for Folsom and we have a pretty good relationship now and you'll be seeing more of that. Um, they have staff, they have funding, they're looking for municipalities to work with at PCA. So that's good. So these are new services that DCA is offering to have offered in the past. Yeah, and it's been a few years now, but I, my knowledge is a new, it's sort of a new program. Yeah, if you'd like more uh, information, the actual office is called uh, the Local, Local Planning Services Division of DCA. Uh, I think they have a web page that the student staff is. Is that a new creative office? I think they've been around for a while, but this is, this is a new effort to take. And I think I might remember correctly that like each year they have a certain amount of like uh, like almost like grand like it's, yeah. it's like these towns apply and only certain you know there's only a, a, a finite amount of towns they can work with each year. Um, so. and they're very involved. I mean they, they, they spend a lot of time. I know from Woodbine, one of the things that they require is to municipality establish a, a working committee of various representatives of each municipality playing the word. You know, zoning board, governing body, zoning officer, school board, you know, so they get a really wide county usually participates. Um, I've sat on a couple of them, Pemberton and then Woodbine. And it's, it's it's a very intensive process, lots of mapping, lots of data. They really dive in and provide um, great service to these municipalities, so otherwise we'd be able to afford to work. Okay. Uh, and we're talking a lot about balance. I mean, I guess planning is about balance. And um, I think one of the things we need to think about perhaps here is the, the commission's clustering uh, standards and uh, how that, I think, conserves uh, trees and increases carbon sequestration. Um, and so I, I see a lot on the map of uh, F20s and F30s. I think the zoning and the changes in the F30s. Um, again, these are web and one of the potential for development there. But um, when, when you look at the balance, uh, you know, I hope in the end, you know, we're, we're doing more good than bad as far as sequestration of, of carbon. Um, one of the important things here, I think, when I, I saw the Southern Pine Beetle, and what I thought was in part of the township is forest management. I mean, is enough forest management being done in, in, in this area, uh, as well as other municipalities. Um, so uh, I, I noticed I looked at the website of Fort Folsom, and they have a shade tree commission, they have an environmental commission. I'm sure they're interested in these things. And I'm just wondering if we work to work together to um, increase um, perhaps the efforts of the state to come in and also the borough to come in and do some forest management. So that you know, if there is a fire, forest fire there that uh, you don't have a massive far, forest fire you know, that's causing damage um, to um, to homes and, and businesses. So um, I think that's that's another one we have to take a look at. Um, and another note, um, uh, as far as I mean, we talk a lot about evaluating um, applications, uh, the Lucy's committee thoughts. And uh, while I was evaluating this application, I, I was looking through Google Earth, and I noticed there were a number of opportunities to solve it. Um, the elementary school, the municipal building. Um, I noticed one building here that had uh, some of the largest arrays of solar with its house with the gas building. Um, so I'm just wondering if you know one of the things that I'm not sure the commission uh, is the body to do this, or maybe they are in audit of. Uh, municipalities, you know, what is their solar potential? And, and, and certainly sending them information on how they, you know, is it, is it, is it uh, economically beneficial to the municipalities, the individuals in the municipalities, um, to install solar on some of the buildings they have. Um, in, in looking at, at Pulse, I know there's a lot of big rooftops there. You know, I'm not certainly an expert on that, but it looks to me like there's potential for a lot of 
rooftop solar. Um, so, um, and I also noticed that the state has a number of sites at Folsom. They have the state police barracks, and they have the Department of Transportation facility. You know, I'm wondering, you know, why why have solar on top of at least in Folsom? So. You were right when you started that not our job to do this, but yes. <laughs> but it's important to say it's public, it is important public utilities job, and um, Commissioner Spigolisky's not here, but the municipal council has had the board of public utilities office that provides these kinds of services to towns. Come to, I think like once a year, the guy comes to talk to mayors, and they come in and they do energy efficiency audits and solar options, and they do all of that for municipalities. Um, and he has been trying hard to get towns to take advantage of it. I mean, we can help share information, but there is some, there is an office in the state that does that for municipalities. Would it be within our purview to uh, recommend or, or you know uh, broadcast that use of that service? Yes, um, and that's what the municipal council has been doing, and we've been sharing that information. And also, um, we are internally discussing. Um, options for us in terms of, of climate and looking at evaluating these things. So there's opportunities there as well. I think it's really important to be able to differentiate what the responsibility, what the commission can do, and what the commission can't do. It's just, you know, um, defined, I guess. So I think we need to do that. But uh, it should be, I think, a part of our discussion. So I don't, anyway. Uh, I, I noticed also, you know, in in, in our area, I mean, Medford Township, for example, has all their elementary schools covered with solar arrays. I think Lumberton has probably. So um, I'm just wondering, I, I think they, they were some kind of grants or program. Is that, do you know whether that program is still in effect? Um, the programs were much more um, attractive several years ago when the ASPREC pricing was higher. So you were getting private contractors from the river to take that risk. Opposed to the public entity, that those programs are not as strong now. But the bigger push now is the community solar, which we talked about. It. Yeah, it's not Russus for So, um, but yeah, the, the, the programs for schools and municipalities aren't as uh, aggressive or dedicated as they once were. She was talking about economics and, and we're, we're concerned that this one's seven up. We're, we're concerned about um, the economic development within Folsom and making it a uh, place that's more affordable to live. I mean, does I mean, solar help that? That that's direction I'm thinking about. I'm sorry. No, so what I was going to say is um, the SREC program is in flux at the moment. Um, BPU is engaged in stakeholder the stakeholder process to determine what the next phase will be because SREC will be phased out and how best to support the solar market in New Jersey. So that is a conversation that is ongoing now and will likely have an impact on what grants will be available in the future. I just want to make you aware of that. I am sort of keeping my eye on it as it develops, but right now, as you said, they're only really in the stakeholder phase trying to ascertain what they're going to do as opposed to in the um, regulatory phase where they're putting forward. Thank you. Yes. Um, one, one follow-up and I'll do it reverse order <coughs> on the solar. Um, I, by happenstance, I talked to a solar developer who said New Jersey is really not a good market now because there's so much uncertainty, nobody's willing to invest. So it would, be, it would help us, I think, if what we're able to do is move forward with that. I guess in, in, in relation to the forest management that you mentioned in the solar, um, was DEP at the table in this group when planning for, for planning for Folsom? Not that I'm aware of, not typically Trying to think now, I'm like the woodline. They will, um, when issue, issues come up during the meetings and discussions with whatever the municipality is trying to accomplish, the UCA will either themselves go and meet with other state agencies or bring somebody in and woodline and bring someone from the Main Street program come in and talk to them or the Business Action Center. Or, so they will, well, I that's maybe Department of Transportation. So they will go and coordinate. But I don't recall the pulse of that happening at all in terms of other agencies or DEP. Okay. 
Um, you know, with respect to forest management, the, the, how would you treat the table? With respect to solar, they have outlined preferred solar areas in the state. So it, would be, it might be helpful to have them on these kinds of things. I think probably just um, our approval of moving forward yes. to the commission. So second. Okay, well in favor of uh, moving uh, this application, this report, uh, executive direction report to Folsom Township Report Commission under consideration. Say aye. 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 Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I we would like to make the, the resolution clear. We recommend to this commission that we do this. Is that this one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a revised motion. It is. Yeah. Okay, so we can just take another vote here. Yeah. Okay. All in favor of the revised uh, resolution? Aye. 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 Um, so our second order of business is the pilot program for alternate design wastewater treatment systems. And Ed is here to do that presentation. Well, good morning, commissioners. Um, good morning. I'm going to briefly recap the um, basis, status, and recommendations of our pilot program. Uh, most of these slides you've all seen before. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the program, uh, but we do have some important recommendations that we'd like the PNI committee to consider as uh, moving on to the full commission. Uh, so my first slide here uh, depicts a cross section of the landscape that shows septic systems and wells and effluent plumes. Um, we can see that there's the potential for those effluent plumes to intersect wells. So that's the public health concern with septic systems. What's not shown here is the potential for those plumes to intersect wetlands and surface water bodies. And that's really the basis for the commission's involvement in septic systems, because we wanna keep the pollutants that are associated with those uh, septic tank effluents out of those water bodies. Uh, throughout the state, we use conventional septic systems. The state does not have consideration given to the impact of nitrogen from those septic systems unless you've got a subdivision that's got 50 or more residences. So you can put a septic system that provides no nitrogen attenuation on as small a lot as you can fit it and you'll receive state approval. That's not the case here in the Pinelands. These conventional septic systems don't remove nitrogen. nitrogen. They do a great job of re removing pathogens, bacteria, viruses, protozoa, uh, on the basis of soil filtration below those disposal fields, but they do discharge nitrogen. These are very passive systems. Uh, this slide here says nitrogen greater than 40 milligrams per liter. That's the concentration that we assume in our model. Quite frankly, those concentrations are based on 1960s, 1970s era flows before we used water conservation devices in homes. So we find today that the concentration of nitrogen coming out of a house is closer to 60 or 70. It's, it's more concentrated because there's less water carrying that uh, nitrogen mass. So the alternate design uh, treatment system pilot program uh, provided us with an opportunity to uh, introduce these advanced treatment systems and um, go one step further than the third party certifications that were granted to these systems. So we've had systems that go through uh, test centers where the test center identifies these systems to be effective at removing nitrogen. But we found here in the Pinelands that under real world conditions, we don't always see those same satisfactory results. So as a matter of fact, we've actually identified a couple that met those third party certifications, but don't live up to the requirement when we test them here. Um, and I have to say that there was tremendous value, foresight in creating a pilot program that didn't just recognize a third party stamp of approval uh, because some jurisdictions have done that. So these systems remove nitrogen through bacterial processes. Essentially they're manipulating the oxygen content, uh, presence and abs absence of oxygen in that wastewater to achieve nitrogen concentrations less than 40. And according to our 
uh, dilution model, you've got to get it down to 14 milligrams per liter if you want to use a septic system on a one acre lot. That would allow you to meet our standard of two milligrams per liter at the property line through dilution. So just real quickly recapping, the pilot program identified the amphidrome system and the BioClear system as meeting our standard for use on one acre lots. You can see that they're re reducing nitrogen from upwards of 50 or 60 down to about 11 milligrams per liter or parts per million. So they're working great. The FAST system uh, didn't quite attain that level of treatment, but they do get that nitrogen down to 18.2. So we can approve that one on 1.4 acre lots or larger. So there's a little bit of a sliding scale there. The chromoglass system was not working. That's one where we identified a flaw that the third party certifiers didn't. So we eliminated that one from the pilot program. Those were the first round of our technologies. And in the uh, current second round, uh, we have good news to report the septi tech system meets our standard at the one acre lot threshold. It's right in line with those others. Uh, concentrations less than 12. They need to meet uh, uh, 14. The bio barrier system, we have to recommend that we remove it from the pilot program because it's not working to the extent necessary for us to approve in the Pinelands. 29.3 uh, is what we're seeing most recently, not far off from the 31.5 that we saw in Chromoglass's case. And I have to say that the trend with that bio barrier system is that things are getting worse over time. So it's not getting better in spite of efforts that are being undertaken by the manufacturer. So I've alerted the manufacturer that we're gonna move them out of the pilot program. They've had trouble up in Long Island as well. So that's one that we wanna discontinue. And then we have two technologies, the Hoot and the Busi, that I thought showed great promise, but those companies have failed to get a foothold in the Pinelands. There's been no systems installed in the eight years that they've been participating. Um, and uh, similar to what we did with an ASHCO system early on in the pilot program, they're not selling systems. They're basically taking up a spot because we limit the number of technologies that can participate. We've advised them that we're going to decertify them, essentially take them out of the pilot program. So just a couple slides to wrap up. So the recommendation report that uh, we sent out, I guess, back in November uh, recommends the continuation of the pilot program. We think that in the 18 years that we've run the program, it, it served its purpose. We've identified some technologies that do allow development to occur at appropriate densities um, and meet our ground, groundwater quality standard. Um, we want to recommend the adoption of a CMP amendment to permanently approve the septi tech system to take it out of piloting status. Um, that essentially eliminates the need for the company to take wastewater samples and submit those to us because we've got adequate data on that system. We see that it's working. And if there are changes in that system, would we reevaluate it? Which one? Yeah, well, so we would. So there's there's changes in terms of physical changes to the configuration of the system. So when the rules were written, we recognized that there's often technological advances that we don't want to get in the way of. So if a company finds a better way to build their system, they need only submit those plans to us convince us that the system will operate in the same fashion as the original design and the executive director is authorized to make that approval. Um, and that's a great question because we've actually seen that happen with the BioClear system. They modified it a little bit based upon advances in construction techniques. Uh, okay, so we wanna recommend uh, approval of SeptiTech. Uh, as I noted, we wanna recommend removal of BioBarrier because it's not working. And those two systems that haven't been sold in the Pinelands, we recommend that they, they come out of the program. And then NSF, National Sanitation Foundation, has a standard 245. That's their nitrogen attenuation standard. Now, we use that to pre-screen technologies. We know that it's not always a guarantee, but we want to introduce up to six new NSF 245 technologies into the program. We'll monitor their uh, wastewater treatment results just like we have with the others. And ideally come back to you with recommendations to approve new technologies. Uh, last time I looked, NSF has about 18 systems that are certified. Just earlier this week, I had a company, Fuji Clean, a Japanese company that wants to sell systems in the Pinelands meet with me. They wanna know when can they put their first system in. So that's one that we know is going to apply. 
to uh, participate in our expanded pilot program. And then um, there's a recognition that this pilot program has been going on as an intensive pilot program for so many years now, 18 years. Uh, and a lot of staff time goes into issuing annual reports and implementation reports, and we've beat it to death now with presentations before the commission. So we want to recommend that we eliminate the requirement for annual reporting. Now, that's not to say that if there's an issue that arises, we won't bring it to the attention of the committee and the, and the commission, but we don't see that there's a need for this intense level of uh, reporting. Um, the next implementation report we feel would likely best be due in 2025. That will give us an opportunity to get new technologies in, have some a uh, couple years of data to present to you so that we can make recommendations uh, with regard to the status. And then there's a lot of things that we've been requiring in the pilot program uh, that we think we can perhaps eliminate to streamline the process, to make it go easier on the part of the technology vendors, the health departments that we work with, and our own staff. Uh, certain things that I feel very strongly need to remain, uh, but we think that we can probably streamline it to some degree uh, to make it less onerous on all. And uh, that, that's the uh, final slide that I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We did give an annual report back in August and the implementation report uh, back in November. They're very lengthy reports. Uh, if you haven't yet looked at them, feel free to give me a call and we discuss anything that might interest you. Okay. Yes. Ed, thanks very much for being for this. Uh, I'm curious, now that we're seeing more systems, that the more competitors that are going to come online and you know, try to prove themselves here, are we seeing any kind of reduction in system costs? We saw a small decrease in system costs. Once the technologies are no longer required to do lab sampling, um, the cost came down some. But I think equally important is the prices have stayed stable. So over the 18 years with the deflation of the value of the dollars being spent, um, the, the costs have remained fairly stable. Um, there's no doubt that, the, that all of these companies look at what their competitors are charging and they come in right at that price point. So we are spurring competition. Uh, we have uh, continued to hold out hope that prices will come down as we get more technologies in. For instance, this um, uh, Fuji Clean system that I met with yesterday, uh, they talk about how they manufacture their system. It comes in in one piece. They think they're going to severely undercut these other systems, but we'll, we'll have to see what they come in at. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, what's the limit on the number of systems we can put into the pilot program? So there's six technologies that can participate. Um, and the reason for that was we didn't want to open it up so that there were so many systems that we'd get so few systems in any given period that we'd only get three or four systems and sample results. So we want to limit it so that we essentially essentially force the uh, uh, use of individual systems so we can get a larger data set to evaluate them. And if we adopt these recommendations, how many will we have served by? Well, so, so we have um, Amphidrome, BioClear, FAST, and SeptiTech right now are four. Now, they're certified. They're out of the pilot program. That opens up an opportunity for six new technologies to come in. Now, I, I'm not necessarily convinced that we're going to get six. When, when we put out a request for um, proposals, we may not get six that want to come into our pilot program. So we'll do it if we can get, let's say, half of that. We'll bring those in. And then we'll see what happens with the market. We'll probably do another round and introduce more technologies in, but we can get up to six at any given time. The, um, it, it appears that you indicated that there might be 60 to 70 milligrams per liter now because of the conserving of water. Uh, and it, it seemed to me, but that, that maybe that's why I want to ask, is are these technologies meeting our requirements even with even if we assume that's 60 or 70 milligrams? They absolutely are. That's what's amazing. So, so the, the uh, efficiency of removal is significantly higher when they go from 60 down to 14 than it would be going from uh, 40 down to 14. So yeah, we estimated 65% nitrogen removal. They're probably doing something close to 70 or 80%. Do we have any um, data on the how many um, lots in the pilots are not meeting their standards. What I'm thinking of is the one acre lots that were approved before the Pilots Commission 
um, was created, and so those are non-conforming uh, uses. So I'm going to turn to our do mean, planners. Do you mean, do you mean, um, do you mean uh, have one acre lots that have houses on them now, with whatever kind of septic system they're using? I think what the is, yes, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what. You know, how many, how many, how many, how many what, what's the problem that we haven't addressed? And I'm not sure we can, but I just wanted to get a sense of that. This has been very effective, it appears. Right. You know, if we find ways to apply it more broadly, maybe we should explore it. But I don't kind of get an idea what the universities mean. So I have to look for you. I think when the pilot program was first adopted back in 2002, um, there's probably an estimate somewhere in that proposal of the number of existing one acre lots in the pipelines. It's a very big number, right? Um, but what I think we probably don't know is how many of those lots already have you know, houses and what kind of systems are they on right now? Because like you said, a lot of them are going to be old, so we want to think about what they have and you know, what they're using. Um, we can certainly, I'm trying to think of another way to get out what you're asking, but uh, we can certainly look at. Um, Existing lot sizes in the areas where one acre lot development is permitted, you know, the village, for example, or regional road areas, really that's where you will see one acre. Um, we can we could try to get at it that way, perhaps we'll be taking a few municipalities where we know that there's a lot of existing, you know, already subdivided areas and try to do some projections. But it, it's a big number, and that's for sure. I, I mean, I'm interested and curious, but I don't want to make work for you. I mean, if we go back to the original okay, data, just, yeah, see. just take yeah, a look at that. That would be interesting. And, I, and I, we applied these the pilot pro program requirements to new systems, so whatever was existing back then, we're presumably still dealing with. Thanks. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. So, you're not going to do a presentation of 2025. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we're that's what we're suggesting. I have a question, not so much about uh, the systems that uh, we're talking about. Maybe maybe it does have to do with that, and that is the methane production from septic systems. Do good septic systems uh, reduce the release of methane? They don't. No, no. No, these systems do reduce, release methane to the atmosphere, um, just like a conventional septic system does. Uh, a little different than a conventional septic system, these release nitrogen gas to the atmosphere, which, to, is, no which is no problem. 78% of our atmosphere is comprised of nitrogen. So they get it out of the soluble form that would otherwise be in the groundwater and release it to the atmosphere, but no methane does get released. Are there any um, studies as to how much not, not that I'm aware of. Now, the, the large sewage treatment plants, they capture methane from their anaerobic digesters and they generally use it in their, as, a, as a fuel product in their, in their plants. Uh, I don't know that there's enough from these small scale systems. I suspect that there's not to make capture and, and use um, feasible. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions, Fred? And thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. So, so we'll, um, jumping ahead a little bit, we're going to talk to you about rulemaking in general in, in a few minutes, and you'll see the septic implementation on that list. But for now, we really just wanted to make you aware of what the recommended changes would be, and we're going to be writing those and working on them. You'll see them in a more formal context. Okay. Um, on to the next topic, uh, update on the amendment to the uh, 1998 memorandum of agreement between the Conference Commission and Atlantic County concerning Atlantic County Park at Lake Lemon. As you may recall, um, the county came and did a presentation. The uh, issue is they need to replace their docks in order to better accommodate their users. The problem is they have a deep restriction that essentially covers the totality of their lake. Um, at the time that they made their presentation, they were contemplating lifting the totality of the restriction and rewriting the restriction. Based on discussions with DEP since that time, what we're moving to is that we're going to do an amendment of the um, existing restriction. That amendment would lift a box in front of the boathouse on, on the lake, lake side 
the board side um, that would allow for configurations of the docks to meet their needs. What I asked the county to do was don't just think about what your needs are now. Think prospectively, uh, 10 year window, 20 year window, and design that box so that you have the flexibility to move those docks around in a way that you'll continue to be able to provide service to your community. By the same token, with regard to the offset, I need to know the acreage not only of what that box is going to be, but also the acreage of what the offset is going to be. So they are currently working in house with their planning department to develop needs and bounds descriptions of those boxes. And once we have those meets and bounds descriptions, we'll be able to move forward with bringing you the amendment to the MOA and also move forward with the combined process EP. And the county and I agree, we're going to do one public hearing to deal with the amendment of the, M of the MOA and the amendment of the heat restriction all at one time. So um, we can't really proceed until I have in hand those meets and bounds descriptions and a better understanding in terms of what the offset acreage is. Um, and they are working on that right now. I actually reached out and got a response this week from the county attorney to make sure that that's moving forward. So that's where it seems like. Any questions? Please. Um, DEP has to approve the amendment to the DEP hearing? So that's correct, under the Conservation Restriction and Historic Restrictions Act. Yes. Um, the area that you're talking about really is probably about an acre or less, uh, reconfiguring the dock, right? And have, maybe having the ability to, to, to change the configuration when needed. That's correct. Um, but I, I I don't want to draw the box for them because no, I don't know what their needs are. So I thought it was important for them to engage in the exercise of thinking prospectively as well. That's what they think they need. Anything we need to do with this? No, I just wanted to update you because things will be a little slower than I would like them to have moved, but it's still progressive. All right, so this is about the third or fourth time we had a presentation. It's about the second time that I've actually updated you on the, yeah, the initial presentation and then I've updated you twice. So, so do they still have a chance of making this dock uh, change um, for this summer? Absolutely, I think they do, but they need to get happen. Yeah. So. <laughs> And so I, I know it. I, I wait a little while and I know it's their attorney. Oh, it's on that. So, but I do think they have the opportunity to, to get it done if they, you know, they just have to get the weeks and that's on. Casey, thank you. All right, discussion of commission rulemaking priorities. Yeah, is, is that just from staff's perspective or can commissioners also? This is a very um, short list. This is our immediate needs list. So this is these are things that we know we need to get done. Um, oh, after I turn that, everybody else's <laughs> microphone. I forgot to do mine. Sorry, Paul. I'll start over. Yeah. This is a short list. Um, so that the things that we're going to talk about today and the initial list are things that we need to do. Their priorities. They're not negotiable. Right? We just have to move on these. And then we're starting to tease out some other things to try to do now. And then we're going to have longer term plans coming soon. So this is sort of our short term list. So, yes, yeah, the answer is no and yes. <laughs> not really. Which one is that? The triangle that writes forward. So, um, and as we had mentioned, we were um, planning on obtaining services of a retired deputy attorney general. We have identified somebody. We are moving forward with that. She's ready, willing, and able to start. So we're going to move quickly soon, which is why we're showing you the list now. That worked out better than we anticipated. She's in the bad, bad news. Yeah. Is the Kokinski Kirkwood disguise the most Would you like to give that presentation? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's our first, our shortest term list. Yeah. Um, as I just discussed, is a separate pilot program rule changes we need to make. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection has changed their stormwater rules. We need to make some adjustments to our rules to be consistent with those. Short, not you know, we're not looking at stormwater comprehensively, we're just doing what we have to do. Coordinated permitting process is the um, 
we talked to you about this once. We have a small need and a bigger need. The small need is we have to address the litigation on the pipelines where the process was identified as not encompassing those projects that um, avail themselves of the Board of Public Utilities municipal preemption, therefore they're not getting local approval. We brought it to the commission. The commission started thinking very big about our processes in general. We need to make this small fix. We're happy that we're going to talk about process separately, but so that's what that is. It's just a small change to address those projects. Um, the uh, cluster rules, um, we found implementation of the cluster rules have sort of an unintended consequence of impacting some small, like one and two unit projects. Yeah, small projects and the old, the old, old approved projects that approvals were twenty years ago, and then they didn't build, or they only built half their units, and they come back, and we struggle with that. We had a whole lengthy presentation that Robin made, um, and we've identified a number of things that need to be tweaked or adjusted to make things work better. For clustering, and I mean these are real, these are real applicants. These are real applications that we're dealing with. Our project we have time to deal with every day. Um, some of them are very sad stories. They're difficult. It's a struggle to deal with these very small projects. So we really do. So, so you're going to try to address some of these concerns too? Yeah, the yeah, yeah, we're going to tweak. Yeah, we're going to tweak the rule. There's only so much we can do right. with the current rule in terms of interpreting, and there's only so much wiggle room. We really do need to make some rules. I showed this to you. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, so this is so for like I don't know ten years we've been talking to you about PVC enhancements. So that's not what this is. We're not talking about major big uh, undertaking of changing the PVC rules and expanding PVC requirements to different management areas. This is to do some very simple updates to the rules for regional growth areas and standards for development to really just clarify the flexibility that the commission and municipalities have in terms of increasing the densities, dealing with affordable housing, they're all of exempt affordable units, um, mandatory PVC obligations and sometimes redevelopment areas, the things that the commission has been able to approve through municipal flexibility over the last five to 10 years. Um, we want to make sure the rules are clear. Uh, what are, how does that work? What's authorized? How far can the towns go? We want to make sure that the rules clearly reflect um, what the commission has been doing and, and what towns are continuing to ask. So that's what that is. It's simple. It's not major, <laughs> not major PC campaigns. That's coming. Um, so that's that's our sort of quick. We need to get these things done. Package. Have we discussed any of these rule changes? You just yeah. Just because some of the specifics yeah. more or less. Actually, I mean, we. I don't think that. Um, I don't think we've discussed stormwater management. We will do that again. This is being driven by is adopted amendments. And so the issue we're going to have there is they're going to send out ordinances to all the municipalities to tell them to adopt the amendment. Yeah. But our rules won't have changed, and so our towns are going to get stuck because they need to respond to DEP. They're going to adopt these ordinances and send them here. And we're going to provide the ordinances based on our rules and say, well, uh, we, don't want, we don't want to put them in a bad place, so we think probably our will we'll obviously be showing you the details of that, but... We're so we're going to try to circumvent that? Or? Right, we're going to make our rules consistent with these rules. So if you look at second middle, so we're going to need to make some minor, hopefully minor revisions to make sure there aren't any little conflicts. Usually our rules are, are stricter, are they not? Um, in, in some instances, yes. Yeah. So we reference the DDP rules in our rules. Yeah, yeah. So we just need to make sure everything is, again, it's not a big comprehensive rewrite, or it's, you know, these small changes that we will show you in detail and explain. But but there is a need to do that sooner rather than later, or the towns are going to get stuck, and then the applicants will get stuck in the big mess. Yeah. Um, if we hire the, the former DAG, do we have the capacity to do these five rules? And what what do you envision the time frame to 
for that. Um, Actually, you should probably get this done in three months. Yeah, you know, quick, these are not significant. Okay, uh, I guess the related question is um, what capacity do we have to, as we go forward, add more to curb what go ANC? There's more slides coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 one, one, one. one. <laughs> like, I have to think. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah
the, the second item that you talked about is redevelopment. Uh, and a lot of times municipalities declare an area in need of redevelopment. And that creates some angst. Okay. And so, yes. so I'm hopeful that uh, we can tighten up standards for redevelopment. Because I'm not sure that redevelopment is appropriate in really any areas of the pipelines. Thank you. Now this way before we go to practice. I just do what it happens to. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> okay, so the um got it. The Kirkwood Cohancy um rules. Those have been roughly drafted. We have a stakeholder meeting, another stakeholder meeting scheduled for the end of this month. Um, we have general consensus from all the stakeholders. These rules have been a work in progress for many years, starting with policy and then rules. I think we brought the rule language, I believe, to the question, no? Um, so that, that is um, a significant amount of work, but we're not starting from scratch. There's a lot of work done, a lot of background work done, so that we plan on doing now. Um, the second um, are, are some, some rules related to solar, and that's this is a limited sort of description. We brought solar to the commission. We, I think we brought solar to the climate committee. We are continuing to think about it um, and ways we can encourage it, require it, all kinds of approaches. Um, so we are going to try to get that in short order. We're not waiting. Um, it may not be the most comprehensive we can do, but to start somewhere, we can answer later. We have more rulemaking coming. But we think we need to look at the rules we have now and see if they're working in a way to encourage solar where we think it should be encouraged to require instances, perhaps. Um, and we've been talking about that. We don't have much language, so this will be this will be a bigger lift for for more work for the um, DAG, who I'm not naming yet because we haven't signed any agreements, so I keep stopping myself from saying it. Um, but doable, I think. Right. Right. <laughs> doable, maybe not the most comprehensive solar rule in one shot, because I don't think that makes sense. I think we just need to start taking bites of the apple and moving forward. So we want definitely those two would be rulemaking that would you know, hopefully come to fruition within the next six months. Okay. Six months to proposal, is that the point? That's all she's doing. That's all she's doing. She has nothing to do. There's yes. no reason. She, well, yeah, all right. I just, I mean, yeah, I think that's fine. With it's not person. like she has a full time job and she's trying to do it. Like what we used to, right? Right. Which is why, because we just are not, we just don't have the time. It's a very time consuming process. With regard to the, the solar, are you, do you expect to include any community solar? Program that we heard about. Maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't know if what we're going to look at. It. I don't know if there's much for us to do. It's sort of driven by Board of Public Utilities. They just had a round of grants. But we'll think to okay, these rules. if there's these something we can do or should do. Right. Right. Yes. So those two will be coming. Any other questions about the solar? Sure. I have a question about water supply and conservation measures. Mm -hmm. Black top asphalt parking you know, contributes negatively to the environment. Yes. Yeah. Is there any possibility that we could take a look at porous pavement or other uh, innovative technologies that might a uh, reduce runoff? And yes. That? But not we're not doing this part of this role. But we are. It is on our list to um, incorporate it to other places and to address it in a, in. A, just looking at that, not tying it to this. So absolutely, it is, it is coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Which package is that in? I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. Wait, that's another one. Um, I saw a question. <laughs> um, the tree replacement standards. Yep. Um, I guess, are you talking about the loss of bars to solve? In this off? instance, How do you okay. that? we're talking, I mean, tree replacement is going to come up in a bunch of conversations. But for solar, um, we, we're struggling in a number of ways with solar. And one of the places that we're struggling is landfills. Um, we have a number of, um, we have 
three landfill projects kicking around now for solar. There was at South Coast River, so there were four. And most of the landfills that are, are going to be interested in doing this um, are very old, haven't been used in many, many, many years, and are treated. They're forested. Things have come back. Um, so it presents a little problem for us. So one of the things we were thinking about is perhaps we could find these landfills that will isolate them to some part of the landfill, not all of it, and then have tree replacement. So people like to call it known at loss, uh, but there would be mandatory tree replacement. So if you you know if you're putting solar on a landfill, you you know you have to clear two acres. There would be a formula for determining something to do with tree replacement. So that's what we're clustering the solar. You might be on landfills. I mean, because they're just setting up a, a, if we had the discussion at one meeting about the value of trees versus the value of solar. So it becomes rough. But in the pilots, as we also discussed at that very same meeting, we don't have a lot of opportunity for solar. Um, so we don't want to give up the landfills because I think it's a good use of that. So this is one of the ways we're thinking of solving the problem. Good. Thank you. But there will be tree replacement again and again and again in other conversations. But just for this one at this time, that's why it's here. Interesting. So, so the intent would be the tree replacement program would be comprehensive across most developments. Not this, but no, going but forward. I don't know. Maybe someday. Maybe, yes. Uh, maybe a picture. But the bigger picture is that if we lose trees, we, we lose uh, carbon sequestration. A lot of municipalities uh, are requiring either uh, tree replacement or payment in lieu of a number of municipalities are requiring uh, tree replacement and or payment uh, regarding the uh, loss of trees. Yes. Yes. Something that could be considered. Yes. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So some of these you'll recognize. Perhaps all of them. Um, you may recall um, a number of years ago we had a very significant rule package that went up through the process and got caught up in the governor's office, so a lot of it didn't go, and some here we, here we are. So one of those was the Black Run project. This was a, a, an exchange of management areas to protect the, um, the watershed and the sources of the watershed and then to allow for the development to sort of be clustered down in, in a certain area. It was complicated because it involved the cooperation of the landowner and the town and us and we had gotten to like this moment and we would, everybody was on board and it just didn't go through the governor's office. Um, so we're gonna try again. Now a different mayor, the, the landowner passed away. Um, just, and we may not do all of it, but we may do the protection part of it and not get to the development part. So that's back on the list. That's all written. We just sort of have to find our way again, talk to the town, and see where everybody is. Um, there were a number of other amendments that were on there. Some of them we wanted to have some old waivers expire. Um, we had tried to charge double fees for where there was a violation. There were a couple of other things in there, some process things that we may try to bring back. The right of way pilot program and herbicide use was not in that package. This is an, an issue that we are struggling with. It's on there just because we have to resolve it. There may or might not ever be rulemaking, but the right of way pilot program is in the CMP. We just extended it for two years. So that's going to be coming, and this is the big issue. So it's on there just to remind us that it's there. We haven't really come to any thought about what we can do with that. Nancy, would be an idea to have a further discussion on her side? Yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah, many, I'm sure. It's very complicated. Sure. But it's on the list. Okay. So that topic might come before the P&I committee at some point. It will. Um, it may not be for two years, but it will. I don't know how far much, I don't know how many more times we can kick this can down the road, but eventually we're going to have to deal with it. The, with regard to her side of application, would that herbicide application be done by certified applicants? We haven't. That would require a requirement if we were going to allow it. That's, that's I mean, as we've discussed. I mean, in the pilot program, you certainly could ask that question because utilities are generally exempt from providing professional herbicide. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. That's kind of what I, I was thinking of. It was kind of a general discussion. I don't think we talk too much about birth abuse. Uh, right. All we talk about is that we're, we're conflicted all over the place. You yeah. have to see him. He allows it in, in many instances yeah. and prohibits it in this one. Right. I was just think that, you know, yeah. just refreshing all of our memories or ideas on this. Um, on that. Does DEP have a program to review that society? Well, they allow. Yeah, they allow. Yes, they allow. Yes, they allow. They allow. They allow. Yes, 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 they allow. Like uh, farmers, you know, cranberry farmers, and different farmers, they rely on herbicides. You know, a forest should rely on, on, on herbicides. So I have a little mind about it, and you know, I'm concerned, so I'm only concerned about it. And that's why. Farmers, foresters, homeowners? Well, I mean, they're not, you know, you can go and buy the herbicides at the store. I mean, there's no control of homeowner use of herbicides. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. If it's only, if you can buy it at the store, it must be okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it must be true. Um, and then um, recommendations from the Climate Committee, which are coming, some we have, we are working on them, we are thinking about them, we're coming back with suggestions. Some will be easier than others, but um, I'd like to do them sort of as a package to. to so it's comprehensive, so you all have a, a sort of feeling that we, we sort of touched as much as we can in our first shot. So we are working on things that we will bring to that committee to start those discussions for women. You think a climate change package? Yeah, I'd like to, I would like to do them as a package. I just think it, I think it will help us to make sure we're <coughs> being broad enough and, and, and covering everything we sort of want to cover. But it doesn't mean we're not going to go back to it, but I, I'd rather not piecemeal it too much. Can you, before you go to the next uh, topic, I would just like to uh, the consent of the uh, uh, committee here and um, talk a little bit more about um, the Lucy's committee after public comment. Uh, we we'll have some pawns. Just a, a discussion and update on what we Thanks. And my quite similar question to you, we'll talk in that discussion about what, what some of the things we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. And not all of you, but many of you will remember plan with you. Um, I'm reluctant to mention it. Fewer and fewer of us. Right, right. Um, but there were recommendations from plan review that are still out there. So we're going to look through those and see if there's anything that still needs to be done, and we would bring those forward for you know rulemaking to start to be addressed. I do um, just suggest that you consult with the chair of the um, uh, Plan Review Committee, um, uh, Ms. Ashman. Um, she, uh, I remember clearly, you know, she went up and, and presented uh, those topics. Um, how many years ago? Three years ago? Uh, 2014. <laughs> 2014. 2014. Was it? Coming up on the next one. No. Oh, no, you don't. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Doesn't the statute say every five years? Uh, five years. No, but no, as you know, no. it is interpreted to mean five years from when we finish doing everything we said we were going to do. No, no, no. <laughs> can, you, can you give us a list of the topics you think are? Yeah. So we're going to so we're going to do that. And this was not intended to be comprehensive, but just to let you know that sort of this is what we're thinking. Um, we're going to do the first and maybe the part of the second piece pretty quickly, and then we're going to start to. Roll out some bigger things. So, so that was my next question: time and uh, capacity. Some of these it sounds like they do go a little faster than others. Well, so, you, you know, right, sure. if we were to schedule a climate meeting within the next month, we would be able to talk about a lot of this, a lot of climate stuff, because we have been thinking about it and we have ideas. So we're ready to start to move that. But that's a slow process, you know. Um, so that one. 
is ready. And, and, and the black artist staff, all the things on this page, the black artist has been written. Yeah, we wrote it. Um, and all the other things that we wrote before would be ready to go. So we can get a pretty significant package ready in three to six months and then start. And, and while we are still working on these other things. And when we have conversations on these other things, we're going to try to have the DVD in the room. That way, that'll make that process go easier. I think that's, I don't think there's any more CMP amendments slides. That's, that's, that's it. all? That's it. Um, Thank you for your indulgence and for your many comments. However, I have two more. <laughs> I was hoping that we would have some amendment regarding clear cutting and control burn. Or at least uh, implement some discussion on that issue. And another thing that might uh, be tweaked is uh, fees for ATV uh, off-road events. So that that was part of plan review. Okay, we you. had a big, big discussion on it with lots of controversy and lots of people. We made some changes to our review process and that was all the commission had that time for the time. So we can most certainly go back to it. Uh, <clears throat> frankly, I was kind of taken aback that we don't have the resources to allow anyone to go out and inspect after an event. And I'm not saying that we should do that for every event, but certainly uh, some spy inspections might be warranted. So thank you, I appreciate that very much. ORB issue like the election of the governor signed a bill that allowed for, for, for um, increased penalties and potential forfeiture. Um, so that could you occur could, could you forward that to us? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could you also forward these slides to us? This, this is very, very useful. I'll post them today if you'd like. Yeah, even if they're not on the website, they're on the screen. So, if you have the video, I'd rather have that on the website. We'll make sure you get it. Anything else as the commissioners of staff? Okay, I'd like to open up the meeting for the public comment. Good morning. Brian, how are you? Good, thanks. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Brian, right. Preservation Alliance. Um, I'd just like to say first, I really appreciate both the presentation and the discussion about the um, rulemaking process coming up. We're very much looking forward to um, making some good progress on those in the upcoming year. And I also want to specifically thank Commissioner Eirich for a couple of times bringing up the, um, the notion of considering carbon sequestration when looking at applications. I hope that's something that uh, the Commission uh, as a whole body can do on a regular basis moving forward, and I look forward to um, the Climate Committee um, being active in 2020. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I would just um, respond to Ryan's comment in, in that it's not only the commissioners and staff that can um, talk about carbon sequestration, and I know Ryan, you do a great job on a lot of the applications specifically talking about what can be done, what should be done. And, and I think the same could be true with uh, each application regarding carbon sequestration. What are the specifics that the public has in mind uh, for us to consider? Um, I, I would be very appreciative of that and beneficial to us. Um, it, I know in reviewing the, uh, app, the app report today, you know, I really had to stretch my mind around, you know, how, how can we enhance Carbon sequestration. We really have to look at each municipality and what we can do. And I know the um, C the um, CMP is written to rely on municipalities and, and their ability to affect change and protect the environment. I think maybe we need to do the same. Nancy, you brought up um, um, the uh, Pioneer Municipal Council. I mean, that's really the segue into addressing this. I think there's a way to enhance that. 
you know, get more involvement from this power that would be great. So, um, Brian, thank you for your comments. Uh, sure, public, if there's anything else. Okay, I close the meeting to the public, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Lucy's Committee. Uh, I know we've done, we've really done a lot, uh, even though we have had uh, what, two meetings, we had a presentation after the commission meeting. Um, Larry Liggett wrote up a um, list of um, uh, criteria and what we can consider. Um, you know, it sounds like staff has been at work in, in putting together some ideas to, to bring before us. I understand the, um, we had an email a while back on our meetings of the UC's committee, uh, and I'm not sure what kind of response uh, we received on that. Um, but uh, I, I think we should, at least after every P and I committee, we might respond to that. Well, um, after every P and I meeting, I think we ought to talk a little bit about, uh, since most of the members, uh, not all the members, not are on the UC's committee. Uh, it's just not Alex. Well, uh, if we establish this um, as a routine discussion. Maybe you might want to tune in through streaming or something like that. We'll just reveal it later. Um, but, um, so that, that messed up my turn. That's full out here. Yeah. Poor Alan, you know, he's missing. But um, what is it we want to do next? Um, I'm glad staff is, is moving in a positive, in a positive direction. Uh, I think we need to do a little bit of this work on a monthly basis. Um, I think maybe we should call meetings when um, there's something very important to discuss or to, to move on. Uh, but again, what are some of your ideas on what we should do this year for the Lucy's Committee? You know, earlier, Mr. Chairman, you brought up concern about the pine beetle devastation. Mm -hmm. And we could certainly ask uh, the director from the Department of Agriculture. Dr. Joe Zoltowski come and give us a presentation on how we might uh, enhance our forest areas. Uh, certainly not, not enough money is available at the state level for, for the type of uh, control that's needed, but uh, certainly we can bring that to the attention of uh, public as well as uh, applicants in terms of uh, trying to Get a handle on that uh, nasty, nasty meal. I, I just wonder if a presentation like that would be uh, not only beneficial to us, but it would be beneficial to the municipality to know about. And, and again, through the um, Pineland Municipal Council, uh, maybe that's a good way to disseminate that information, too. Yes. The most important thing that we can do is the thing that we should direct our efforts on initially is uh, making uh, rule changes to the CMP, looking through the CMP at, as the directors proposed here in this package of uh, limiting provisions. And we need that. I mean, this whole scenario map came up today, and um, Mr. Iyer rightly said what's the impact on sequestration of carbon. There is no provision in the CMP. It says we have to look at that, or that, that an applicant has to look at it and, and meet a certain standard. That's the kind of thing that we need to address. There are many other suggestions that we members of the Lucas Committee have posed as things we'd like to see as rules. I know that I've suggested things that are, are very operations here at the, the complex. How can we maximize the, the way we operate as a commission? Sure, we are doing our best to mitigate the effects of climate change. So, is that an example? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think we should be saying that. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to focus on those things and uh, put our attention to coming up with language and coming up with a preliminary package. I mean, as, as the director said, and I, I agree with her completely, it doesn't need to be, you know, you do it once and then it's done. But we should do something as broad and comprehensive as possible. Uh, to start, and then over the years, and then it is what happened. But that's where I'd like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree with the Chairman that 
we should try to raise this monthly. But he and I, if not otherwise, in that schedule, it looks like me and I, I believe I didn't respond, so I <laughs> It's okay. No one did. <laughs> I didn't raise any this. Well, you and I were talking about it before it even started, so you get a pass, but I sent it to you. You sent it back to me. You said send it to the committee. I did. Wow. So I, 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 I apologize. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to hear from the staff about what, what kinds of things you've been thinking about. I know we talked about some of them in the committee, but what you put out of the plate that maybe we can put on that CMB agenda. Let me say now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Flood hazard maps showing areas that are subject to threat from flooding both now and in the future, and then talking about actions to take to address that concern, which could be bigger buffers, it could be no development, it could be impervious cover limits, more stringent in those areas than other areas. That's one thing. Um, so when we talked about um, some things I can't say out loud because I haven't talked to all staff about them and their heads will explode. So I can talk about it to you privately after. Um, <laughs> the net loss of trees. Right, well, the net loss of trees, which would be tied to solar and could also be tied to almost exactly. anything else. Mandatory solar installations for certain projects in certain areas. Rooftop, we can't, you know. Rooftop, we can, we can talk about doing. On the ground is very difficult because then we bump into some other issues. We have to be more cautious with that. And flooding, we have flooding with water conservation, the quick compliance rules, um, trees, and ways to get at all of, all of those things, which would be the bigger sort of how we actually impose requirements without putting us in a position of writing standards that will require ordinances, that will require towns to do things. That's not if that's not the way to do it. I want to try to get at it at the earlier stages of planning side of that wall where there that that the municipalities plan as we talked today, they would incorporate it. So you have to so they would be, at the municipal level there would be focus on it and then at our level there would be other focus on it and then the department of environmental protection, whatever focus they're gonna have would also be there. So there would be like three levels for us. But I'd love to hear more about that not now, but that's that's very interesting. I guess two things that come to mind if you want to think about. One um, is uh, electric vehicle charging stations. I mean, that's I haven't looked at the bill, the, the law that just was passed, but that's something we've talked about a little bit. We might want to look at that. And the other one is um, examination of heating and cooling systems in, in buildings that could, you know, pr uh, lower our carbon footprint and lower the greenhouse emissions. And I'm secretly hoping that those that like the energy efficiency stuff and the electric will come from other agencies that we could then rely on it. I keep waiting for it. So uh, that, those are my hopes on things like that. But if they don't come, then yeah, we can, we can get up there. Well, maybe, maybe our first um, call is to those agencies and say, well, we want to move forward, we need your help. Come talk to us. We can get you there. I, uh, I had a meeting, which we talked about a commission meeting, but I was briefly talking about a meeting with uh, Olivia Glenn from DEP, she's Parks and Forestry, and I asked what they were doing about forest management and didn't get much back. So their department is, is still finding its way. But I would, I would prefer to rely on the department for those things and for us to do it because they just have all the expertise. So I, I, I nudged and get much, but hopefully something's going to come out of there. Just a, a general question. In large applications, large housing or large commercial Applications, do we require the applicant to submit uh, an environmental impact statement? Should no. and should we? We as a policy really do that. Well, but the reason the reason I ask whether we should is because that would be an excellent place to insert uh, our desires regarding carbon sequestration and other items that we would like to implement. Because generally, municipalities don't look real heavily. The environmental impact. Thank you. Yes. And remember that scheduling message, which must be. Is this something? Because honestly, I, I, I try to reply. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, is this something that, since most of us are here now, we can try to resolve now? Scheduling? Yeah. Well, it was just sort of options. Like, either we would schedule committee meetings, specific committee meetings, or we would join it onto P and I, or I forget what the third option was, some combination of that. If it works for you to try to have conversations, like if the P and I schedule is sorry, Paul, if the P and I schedule is light, we can just stick it in there. Uh -huh. Today was not a particularly light schedule, so if we then launched into a big discussion, it might have been too much. But we can try to do it with P and I. Um, we need to consider Commissioner Avery and, and what that means. You can just put him on P and I. That's all I want. Um, um, and then we could do that. And if it just we could maintain the separate committee for when we wanted to, you know, just a big three hour push on something. But otherwise we could give you updates at every P and I meeting as to where we are or whatever. So I would suggest a climate meeting soon to sort of set us on a rulemaking path and some other paths that you're interested in. And then we could do updates for the next three months of P and I meetings or whatever and when it's appropriate for have the climate committee meet again because that way we can have a more focused discussion, we can have more public, we get there, you know, get there and put focused on that rather than having it just be another piece. So that would be my suggestion. It's the beginning of the year, I think we should have a meeting. We're ready to talk about some big picture things and get your input to put us on a path to do more specific work. So that would be good. And then for the next three months or so, we'll do updates at PI and then we'll have another meeting and, and maybe do it that way. So the burden on you is not as great, but we still maintain a separate committee with its own agenda. That's a practical way. So why don't we? Uh, I'll send an email out and uh, through, okay. through your office. Yes, it's here, so And we will uh, try to establish a meeting so you can do that presentation. Sure. I, I like your suggestion. I think it that, that conserves time, energy, and gets things done. Thank you. Yeah. So I assume the, the summary for the PMI meeting, uh, so the meeting will be. Um, on the commission meeting in, in that, that summary. And then the public that comes commission meeting will appear at the commission. I'm glad the public is so interested in us. Okay, anything else? Okay, so the update to losing this is uh, finished. And so are there any uh, committee member comments? I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye.